Okay, the last thing I want to talk about today, and the last thing before uh, the material for the exam is done, is horizontal transfer. Horizontal transfer is one of these things that always lurks in the background of phylogenetic analysis. Sometimes in a good way, sometimes not. We talked about specific cases where horizontal transfer can be a problem. I and mean, if you're studying antibiotic resistance genes, you're not going to learn anything about the organisms that carry them phylogenetically. But horizontal transfer has the potential to be a lot more fundamental an issue in phylogenetic analysis than nuts. And so here's a trait from Ford Doolittle's group. Ford Doolittle is a guy at Halifax, Nova Scotia. This shows his conception of the evolution of living things. He, he believes that there are three domains, like so, but that their relationship isn't the same bifurcating tree that we normally think of it as, but this kind of network of stuff. And this comes from the notion that we know that lots of nu um, nuclear genes originated in the mitochondria and chloroplasts. And so that's what these branches are. Here's a branch for the cyanobacteria, and a bunch of genes went over here to um, to, to plants and ultimately to archaea as well. Here are the proteobacteria. We know some genes went over here into the deep eukaryotes as well. And, and their notion is, is, that, is that this kind of stuff happens all the time. Push really hard. If you look at bacterial genomes, it's pretty clear that somewhere between 50 and 60 percent of it in many organisms is horizontally transferring a lot. And so genes for metabolic functions, genes for phenotypes of various kinds, nitrogen fixation, etc. These genes move around. Now, not on a daily basis, but in terms of geologic time scale, they move around very rapidly. But organisms are transient collections of genes, then does phylogeny mean anything at all? Right? If, an or if every gene in an organism has a different history, then there really isn't any meaning in the notion of a phylogenetic of an organism, only of the genes it contains. I think this is a mistaken notion. And, and let me explain why. There are a variety of reasons why. So take you, for example. Did, did you inherit all of your genes vertically from, from one ancestor to and then a single ancestor from them, etc.? No, you, live, you, you are part of a population, right, where gene transfer occurs all the time. Every generation, there's a gene mixing. And so you are a mixture, and your genes have different origins throughout your genealogy. That doesn't mean that your phylogeny doesn't mean anything. Bacteria also transfer DNA. Now, in bacteria, sexual exchange of DNA which is what we're talking about, and reproduction are unlinked. In, in big eukaryotes like plants and animals, the sexual reassortment of genes and reproduction are part of a single process, right? They've been linked. The reason for this, by the way, is a little unclear. But in most organisms, including bacteria and archaea and most eukaryotes, protists, the, the sexual exchange of DNA and reproduction are independent processes. But they occur nevertheless. And, and this is analogous in bacteria to intraspecific recombination. So two related bacteria can exchange DNA either, either explicitly, for example, through conjugation plasmids and so forth, or by sucking DNA out of the environment left over from dead relatives. And then use homologous recombination to recombine that into their own genome. Now, in order for that process to work, the sequences have to be similar enough for homologous recombination to work. And so this kind of, this, this intraspecific recombination only occurs between bacterial genomes that are very closely related. This intraspecific recombination is, I think, an awful lot like the sexual exchange of DNA in breeding population. And so you get alleles for different genes and, diff and different bacteria that get resorted as time goes by. Yeah? Are there any um, theories as to why we linked um, like sexual reproduction with the um, 
there, there, there's a, there are a lot of notions about why this might be, and some people believe very firmly in one notion or another. It, it's pretty clear that it it's probably related to parasites and predation and this arms race between in competition between different organisms. And, and the result is, is that you want lots and lots of, of variation within the population that you care because the populations are small, right? I mean, there are a lot of people on Earth, but compared to the number of E. coli, the number is trivial. And so while normal variation and, and, and rare intraspecific recombination is okay for very large, numerous populations like E. coli, for plants and animals, the populations are so small that you need to have recombination more explicitly part of the life cycle. Um, how many of you remember, well, potato blood, perfect example. You guys know that in Ireland people used to grow potatoes and everybody ate potatoes, but they were all exactly the same strain of potato and a single fungus, actually it wasn't a fungus, it was Cytophthora, which is usually called a fungus, but it isn't. Um, ended up in Ireland, and because all the potatoes were related, they were wiped out. And the result was famine and migration and all this kind of stuff. The corn blight in the 70s in the US. The current ongoing banana crisis in the world. We're, we're losing our current strain of bananas. Some people are worried about chocolate as well, by the way. That may be a dismay to some of you. Um, the reason they're in trouble is because there isn't enough variation in the population. And the parasites, which could evolve faster, take advantage of that. And so a way to fight that sort of thing off is to increase variation within the population of these low population organisms and recombination through sex, sexual exchange during reproduction is one way to do that. Does that, is that an answer to your question? A little bit? I don't remember who asked it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. good. So it turns out, though, that homologous recombination between related organisms isn't the only way that horizontal transfer takes place, not, not just in bacteria, but in all creatures. Another way is the transfer of, of genes between distantly related organisms. Now, this happens orders of magnitude, many, many orders of magnitude less frequently than homologous recombination transfer. But again, we're talking geologic timescales in organisms that have generation times measured in minutes rather than decades. And so this does happen. And there are lots and lots of examples of this. We know, for example, that most of the genes that were originally in the mitochondria are actually now in the nuclear genomes of our host. Um, that's a great example. Um, antibiotic resistant genes go everywhere. Pathogenicity islands in bacteria usually come from somewhere else. The major pathogenicity islands in E. coli seem to have originated in cyanobacteria, but have picked up stuff in their travels around. Um, Proteorhodopsin, we'll talk about this later. This is a photopigment. It's a very, very simple form of phototrophy. It's a, it's a light driven proton pump. And it occurs in oceanic bacteria of all different kinds. It clearly is mobile. Nitrogen fixation genes. These genes move around. This kind of stuff happens all the time. And again, if you look at the E. coli genome, something like half of the genome is different from one strain to another of E. coli. People call this the pan genome, the, the, the kind of genome that's very much in flux. Another kind of that long scale of lateral transfer is hybridization. That is two different organisms, two different species that merge to become one. This happens in the plant world all the time, right? Um, it turns out that it also happens with other kind of organisms on very rare occasions. They have to be pretty closely related, but, but not the same thing. And so the question is, what does this mean? What does all this horizontal transfer mean to a phylogenetic tree? Does it mean that our phylogenetic trees are useless? That they have no meaning? That they only tell you about the ancestry of ribosomal RNA and nothing else? Or is horizontal transfer a, 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 a trivial side show to, to, to phylogeny. I think it's abundantly clear that the answer is somewhere in between. Right? So, most of the genes in bacteria move around at some frequency. But these are the genes for phenotype. These are the genes for metabolism. 
there is a core, 30 or 40 percent of the genome, that seems to be very resistant to horizontal transfer. And these genes form a coherent phylogeny for the organism. These are the genes for the information processes in the cell. DNA replication, transcription, translation. The central dogma stuff. Now, why, do, why are these genes resistant to horizontal transfer? There's probably a couple of reasons for that. Number one, all of these proteins, well, most of these proteins and RNAs interact with lots and lots of other stuff in the cytoplasm, right? So I can't tell you how many proteins the small subunit RNA interacts with. There's you know, 30 proteins in the ribosome itself, and then all the other stuff that goes on in translation. Chances are pretty small that you could take a gene from a different organism, put it in E. coli, and have it work as well or better than the original one. That would require a bunch of changes in all those other proteins to adapt to that. So that connectivity of function of, of, the, of these RNAs and proteins makes them resistant to horizontal transfer. The other thing, the flip side of the coin is, there really isn't any advantage to it. Because these are genes to the central, the central functions of the cell, the cell's already got those functions. And moving, moving you know, I don't know, ribosomal protein L30 from yeast into E. coli isn't going to give it any change in phenotype that gives it an advantage. There's no selective pressure for that kind of um, mobilization. So on one hand, it's hard to do it. On the other hand, there isn't really much advantage in doing it. And so horizontal transfer doesn't happen much. Yeah. If the core, doc, if the core genomes all the same, and there's no By, by drift, and that, that's where that's why these trees are useful, right? Because they do change by drift. Um, there's another issue I think that minimizes the impact of horizontal transfer, and this is that genes in general move from one organism to another, a, one or a few at a time. What happens to those genes when they land in a new home? They have to function in a new environment, right? new genetic cellular environment, they're pretty quickly going to become part of that environment. And so they may have originated somewhere else, but they pretty quickly adapt themselves to their new place and become part of the old. And so I, I've got a couple examples here. Here's, here's my fun car. This is a 1968 Lotus Super Saddle. I love this car. It runs it all, which is you know, at the more current moment. Most of the bits of that car have been replaced at some point in the does that mean it's not a 1968 car anymore? No. Because when I took a part out and put a new one in, that new one had to be integrated into the pre-existing structure. Even major changes, like changing from a generator to an alternator, and you have to worry about what that means, but they're different kinds of things. Um, if, I put a, if I put an alternator from a Jaguar in this, in this Lotus, does that mean the car is more like a Jaguar than it used to be? not have the same function as the other part, it doesn't make any difference, right? And so the fact that you have added parts to a piecemeal, it's a little bit, um, one, of the, one of the requirements for evolutionary change to take place is to have variation. Where does that variation come from? One source is mutation, right? But another source is you acquire a gene from somewhere else. And so in my view, horizontal transfer, to a large extent, is just a source of genetic variation within the population. It doesn't mean that there isn't any genealogy. Think about it this way as well. Probably there aren't very many atoms in your body right now that you had when you were born. I mean, you know you drink water all the time and you expire water. Um, the carbon in your body, you, you burn stuff and exhale it and so forth. Um, maybe there's some calcium from when you were born, but not a lot. Um, your body, the elements of your body turn over on a continuous basis. Does this mean that you're not the same person you were when you were born? That, that you're a different human being? Well, you've changed, obviously, but you're the same person. Having new stuff come in and replacing old stuff and old stuff going away doesn't change the fact that, you're, that, that, that organization 
is the same as before. I, I see phylogenetic variation, phylogenetic change in the same way. Sure, genes come and go, but there's a core that stays the same, and any parts that come in adapt to that new environment, and any things that go, when they get to a new place, they in turn change to match their environment. So this notion of genes coming and going um, is it, something that people are struggling with right now and, and understanding how that works in phylogeny and what impact it has. One interesting thing that people are doing these days is creating algorithms that generate phylogenetic trees that aren't trees but are networks. And you can imagine a network, network tree that shows for every gene where it goes over time. And so the main branches would follow the traditional taxonomy or traditional phylogeny, but you might have a thin line that goes from one to the next representing the movement of the gene from one organism to another. Here's one. <clears throat> this was done by, by um, a lady named Perdita Phillips. She's Australian. Uh, working at Ford, Ford Doolittle's lab. She redrew, she was an artist, and she redrew that tree I showed you a minute ago in a little more nice, in a little nicer way. But what I've done here is I've colorized the three domain tree within that. And if these branches represented the amount of genetic material present, these would be major trunks following through here, and these would be much thinner vines or threads connecting them. I think that would be a realistic way of thinking about these phylogenies and the genealogy of the organisms that carry them. Notice, however, that these transfers, these cross branches amongst the tree, get more and more frequent the deeper in the tree you get. This is probably realistic. And think back in time. Here we have three domains. But what about here? At this point in time, you've got a bunch of organisms that exchange DNA fairly frequently. And it turns out that this is probably, well, there's some reason to think that this is accurate, that deep in evolutionary history, horizontal transfer was much more common and essentially erased phylogeny as it went along. And there's one view that holds that the emergence of these three domains represents the transition from an evolutionary process where gen genetic exchange was haphazard to where organisms could actually have a meaningful phylogeny. And that each of these three domains represents a group of organisms that emerge from that global genomic rearrangement. Now, whether that, I mean, it's a little bit hard. That would have happened something like 3.8 billion years ago. We don't have much to go on on that. But, it's, but there, there are theoretical reasons to think that that might be the case. And so the last common ancestor, we normally think of this as the last common ancestor, right? But let's keep in mind that it was probably much more complicated than that. Any of you guys ever seen an uh, evolutionary tree of, of human species? It's, it's branched. There's all kinds of things. Well, most of them are dead end, right? And there's only one species of human alive today. But that doesn't mean that there weren't more interesting things going on in the past. And that's true of all of these. All right. So in your notes, you can draw a big dark line under what you've just written. And that's what you're responsible for for the midterm exam. We're done. On Friday, we'll have a fun discussion session on Yellowstone. I hope to see you all there. Um, it's a really easy one and, and lots of beautiful pictures. I'll see you then. I'll probably see you in lab, though, too. <laughs>